Whether Robert Breaker realizes this, this or not, what he just said is exactly what Adventists say. Exactly. To a T. We don't even change the language. But then somehow he can remove certain of the Ten Commandments. And which ones that is? Well, there's not a foundation for it. It's more by... So the idea that Jesus rising on the first day somehow negated the commandments is, uh, to me, like a false pretext because you've just made the assumption and provided no evidence other than them meeting up. How does that match keeping holy something designed by God? It just doesn't make any sense to me. Welcome everyone to another Truth Matters. I'm Mackenzie Drebbit with Matthew Shanshay. And we are going to jump right back into a topic that we left last time, which is reviewing some arguments against Sabbath and pro-Sunday observance. Mm -hmm. So we kind of finished up with talking about the covenant, the different covenants and the law, and we're just going to kind of go right back into it. Matt, could you start us off with a word of prayer as we start our study? Yeah, let's go ahead and, and pray. Father, we thank you again for the opportunity to serve you and to rightly divide truth from error. Lord, we just seek your truth, and we seek that anybody who wants to know you might understand this and choose you and live. And Lord, we just ask for all the blessings upon um, people who are still seeking and understanding, trying to understand this information, that you might uh, shed some light and that we might play a, a small role in sharing what the truth might be and the reasons for that. So we thank you for this opportunity in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're going to pick up right back at the video where we left off. Yeah. People, uh, probably seen that we we stopped at a uh after a long <laughs> review yeah. so far but we're going to continue now and see how far we can get yeah and for those who are first you know maybe tuning into this before seeing the last one we're reviewing a, a, a pr pretty popular protestant preacher named robert breaker uh and we are going and walking through again he's just kind of the example of what the Protestants generally think about Sabbath and Sunday, and so we're using that as an opportunity to both uh, show what they teach and what maybe we think is is different from that, uh, but also to kind of show people who watched any of Robert's stuff about this that what he says about Seventh-day Adventists in particular isn't true. Uh, and I think the last episode, we did a pretty good job of showing side by side what he's saying and what uh, our texts say uh, and how that is different. Again, this is not like any like attack or calling out. It's more just a, trying to be a healthy educational exercise to show the difference between why people believe what they believe and and why maybe others believe other things. And, and ultimately, the individual watching gets to choose for themselves. But the goal here is to really try to clean up some of the misnomers and I think if, for those who are watching this and didn't see the last one, go back and watch the last one because so much of what we have deconstructed really plays a role in how we're going to comment in this video. Uh, and I know it's not as um, uh, maybe as exhilarating as some of the other stuff that we've done for people, but it's almost, in my opinion, more important that we're really going deep because if we think we're going to stand up at the end of time for the truth, well, then we're going to be going up against this exact mindset. Yep. The the reasons for Sunday, the reasons not for Sabbath, and all the various things that go along with it. So we're going to continue on that walk, and we'd encourage anyone to go back and watch uh, the last one first if they haven't yet. Yeah, Christ is important in what he did, but what about the Ten Commandments, they say? Don't we have to keep the Ten Commandments? Well, the Ten Commandments are found in Exodus chapter 20, and they are wonderful. They are very moral. There is some moral law there. And the moral part, we do follow when we get saved, because we are led by the Spirit of God. We don't keep the Ten Commandments to get saved. When we are saved, we do right. So that was a, that's a pretty important distinction there, because... Whether Robert Breaker realizes this, this or not, what he just said is exactly what Adventists say. Exactly. To a T. We don't even change the language. We don't keep the commandments to be saved. We keep them as a reflection of our faith because we are saved in Christ. Yep. And I couldn't agree with Breaker more with that reasoning. 
The simple difference here is while we're in agreement there, he thinks Adventists are, as we talked about at length last time, talking about the law of Moses. At no point has any Adventist that I've met that you know, studies and understands what we teach that says that we're under the law of Moses and that somehow we're keeping the Sabbath, earns our own salvation to heaven. Like it's just so far off from what the real thing is that it also goes to show that Breaker here realizes that sinning is still a bad thing. That you shouldn't, just because the law of Moses has been done away with, you shouldn't sin anymore. He brings out, he says, there's some moral things here, right? Almost like the whole Ten Commandments isn't moral, Mm. but there is moral parts to it. Right. And saying, we don't keep it to be saved, but we don't sin because of our relationship with Christ. But then somehow he can remove certain of the Ten Commandments. And which ones that is, well, there's not a foundation for. It's more by uh, an unacknowledgement that it's removed. Mm. That's his argument anyways. Mm -hmm. And if we're not supposed to sin, like we said again, what's the law, how much of the law, and what of the Ten Commandments isn't moral then? That would be my question, if it's not all moral. Yeah, and he's saying, you know, he'll say that, oh, we shouldn't kill people today, uh, and we shouldn't sin, he's saying right here. But then, like like you said, which ones are you getting rid of? Which ones are you keeping? You you keep no gods before God, but you get rid of the Sabbath, but you keep don't kill people. Like, it just, it's it's very nonsensical. Can we have idols now? Well, exactly. You go down the list, and my guess is... He'll say, no, you can't have more gods before God. No, you can't have idols. No, you can't take the Lord's name in vain. No, you, you can't kill. You can't steal. You can't lie. You can't covet. He's going to say yes to all of them. The only one he says no to is the Sabbath. Yeah. And I, I hope that maybe at some point that sticks in his mind, that why would you say yes to nine out of 10 and then actively argue that one's being removed without a single verse anywhere of God saying it's been removed in any way? And we're going to yeah. actually look at Sunday a bit. Uh, uh, more. And we'll get into all the commandments as he's mentioning them a little yeah, bit later. Exactly. And you know, in the Bible, we're told by the Apostle Paul what some of those Ten Commandments were back then, and then he applies them to today. But did you know the Apostle Paul never applies all Ten Commandments to us? What are the Ten Commandments? Well, example, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, things like that, thou shalt not covet. But there's one of those Ten Commandments in the Old Testament that is never, ever told to us today to keep. As Paul reiterates some of those for us today. And that is the fourth commandment, keeping of the Sabbath. There is not one verse of Scripture anywhere in the entire New Testament does it say we keep the Sabbath today. We are told by Paul some of the Ten Commandments and he gives them to us. Let's go to Romans chapter 13. But he doesn't give all ten. He leaves out the Sabbath for some reason. wonder why. He gives you just five of the Ten Commandments. And he does not mention the fourth one, which is keep the Sabbath. Now, in the example that he gave, and I cut out the part where he read through it because anybody can go look up. He does give all five commandments. He does give five commandments. But he, he, he says the Sabbath isn't in those commandments, but... There are also other commandments that aren't in there, including right. there are no gods before God, including the idols, including the Lord's name in vain. So is he saying because the Sabbath isn't in those that we should disregard the other ones that mm-hmm. are part of the first four? Exactly. The other side of that is also when he's speaking to somebody in that in that context of that verse, and I can't remember, he might, he might go on to describe it a little bit more. You see that Paul's talking to somebody about their relationship between person to person. And one of the things I don't think I've seen Robert Breaker, you know, kind of vocalize or realize, it's not saying he doesn't realize it, but he might not, is that the last, the, out of the Ten Commandments, the first six, or the first four are our relationship to God. That's how we love God. We don't have any other gods and all the other pieces. Yeah. The last six are our relationship with, with mankind. Yeah. And in that particular example, he's explaining specifically the last six mm-hmm. because he's talking about how we treat each other. Actually, and not even all six. Because here he says he only mentions five. So does that mean we can disregard our parents now? Right, right. Because honor your mother and father wasn't in there, right? And so that that's where like 
I wonder if he realizes that he talks so much about, oh, do they even read their Bibles? But do you, do you even really understand the context of what you're reading most of the time? Because it's very clear that the focus of the passage that he's getting rid of the Sabbath from is just based on laying out the relationship we're supposed to have with each other in keeping those. This context is really important because when you go to, when Jesus would go to heal someone, he would say, go and sin no more, which means nothing to someone who doesn't know the law. But when he said, go and sin no more, who was he talking to? He was talking to Jews. All these people were Jews. They knew that what they did caused whatever is happening to them. Not in all cases, mm -hmm. but in a lot of these cases, he said, go and sin no more, right? So there was something that they knew that they needed to change. Mm -hmm. And he used the healing as a way to redirect them back to what they understood. So here, and when Paul's talking, the context is important. Is he talking to a Gentile? Is he talking to a Jew? Is he talking to these? And what, what are they talking about? It's like when the sheet came down for Peter mm. and, uh, you know, he was told kill and eat. That was not talking about eating animals. Because later it's said that that was a representation to Peter to say that no man is unclean. Just because you're not a Jew doesn't mean you're unclean and you don't deserve the gospel. Exactly. And then he sent him to a bunch of Gentiles to go preach the gospel. Right. So, uh, you know, I think it's it, when we're looking at him saying the commandments are not in the New Testament, Paul mentions some, but the Sabbath's not in there, that's all not correct. And we're going to look at that a little bit more later and dive in that all the Ten Commandments are there, the Sabbath is there. And, and he's just uh, making, again, like these kind of leaps in logic that because he didn't mention others, that those must not be valid, and only the ones he mentioned are. But again, he's just selecting the Sabbath when five of the com other commandments are not mentioned either, yeah. uh, or four besides the Sabbath. All right, let's keep going. I believe there's a lot of people out there that are mixing the law and grace. They're mixing works and faith. They're mixing a curse with a blessing, okay? And by so doing, they're doing it to their own detriment. And that is so sad because their immortal soul is probably going to be damned. And a lot of people, they make... Just a little thing, he said immortal soul. Yeah. And that bothers me because the soul is not immortal without God. The immortality, God alone has immortality. Uh, again, it's this immortality of the soul thought, and it's small and subtle, Yeah. but if, brothers and sisters, if you feel intent on using that phrase, it's the mortal soul, the mortal soul, not the immortal soul. Just like his, oh, in a thousand years here on earth, these are subtle, but they're a peak inside of the th greater theology that are very, very concerning for me as a Bible believer, because, well, we're not going to go into the state of the dead and, you know, all of that stuff here, but... And, and then uh, just to clarify, in the statement, the mortal soul, in the Bible context, and everybody should go take a look at this, and we have a lot of resources on this, the soul is the whole being. Mm -hmm. It's not an essence. It's not a spirit. It's not a separate entity. Yeah. You are a soul. Yeah, the body plus the spirit is the soul. Yeah. Uh, and we have examples of that, but we're not going to go through that right now. But I just want to make it, it clear, those little subtle things, If we need to be listening for those. Because if you're going out into the world and trying to listen to teachers, we have to be attuned to catch the errors or we're going to start thinking these things are okay. Salvation into, well, yeah, Jesus did that, but I got to do this. Oh, so what he did to save you wasn't enough? Now you've got to do something too? So you're the co-savior along with Jesus? So there is no, anywhere in the New Testament, any command to keep the Sabbath today. Well, the people in this place that he's writing to, they wanted to keep the law. So they could say, and look at how good I am. And they wanted to make it all about them in the flesh. But there's a certain denomination that goes to church on Saturday. And they want you to believe that you have to keep the Old Testament law and believe in Jesus. They have a faith plus work set up. And they say, yeah, you've got to keep the Sabbath. They go so far to an extreme. 
extreme with their teaching that they tell you this. If you go to church on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. And you just laugh. Because the mark of the beast is in the right hand or in the forehead. How do you get something in your right hand or your forehead by going to church on a certain day? We're not going to dive into the mark of the beast now. But I want people to realize, look at the, look at the theology he has. He doesn't know what the hand and the forehead means in relation to worship. But we're going to take a look at that as we carry on through the rest of this video because he tries to go more into the Mark of the Beast later, and that's a more appropriate time for us to dive in. But he doesn't realize that there, there is very much, all of this is about worship, and we'll look at that closer. And he mentions something, they have a faith and works religion, mm -hmm. but in James chapter 2, it talks about all these people, the faith, but faith without works is dead. Yes. And this is in the New Testament. So how do you balance that? This faith without works is dead. So we need to have the actions that show our faith, yes, right? Exactly. If if you believe that running 10 miles a day, you're going to lose 10 pounds, well, you're going to run the 10 miles. If you don't do it, maybe it's because you don't believe it that much. Mm. You know, I don't know. It's probably good, but it probably ain't going to do that much, right? Mm. You do things that you believe in it. We believe Jesus is coming. So we act a certain way. We're not going to act it any differently if we didn't think he was coming, possibly. Mm. I mean, we shouldn't. We should act the same. But, you know, people would be, oh, if I knew Jesus was coming tomorrow, I would, I would be totally different. Why? Why are you waiting for that? Yeah, that moment. But we have to have the works that correlate with the faith, not to be saved by it. And let's just see what Jesus said about this. Walk as Jesus walked in faith. 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to him be glory, both now and forever. Amen. So it's not just receiving Christ and that's it, you're done, you just sit around waiting for him to come back. You grow in grace, you grow in knowledge. And then what do you do? It says, 1 John 2.6, He that saith he abide in him ought himself also to walk, even as he walked. Mm -hmm. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. Be ye therefore followers of God and dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us. If ye know that he is righteousness, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous even as he is righteous. Mm -hmm. Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him. He cannot sin because he is not born of God. It, it's just like Jesus said, a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, right. and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. You will know it, them it, by their fruits. You'll know them by their fruits. It becomes automatic mm. almost. Mm -hmm. And you, how can you tell if they're, they're fruits of faith? If everyone's just sitting, not doing anything, they see a person on the side of the road that needs help, they don't do anything, they you know, are going around killing and adultering and all this stuff, not repentant, not looking, yeah. you know, that just doesn't, that's, that's not going to produce good fruit ever. And, and Jesus, I guess I agree with you, it's abundantly clear. Over and over he says, do as I do, have the same mind, walk as I walk, keep my commandments. And he says, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Here's Jesus himself saying, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you keep my commandments, you'll abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Mm -hmm. So they're defining love as keeping the commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And this, my commandments. What is Jesus' commandments? Mm. Well, who is the one who gave the commandments? Yeah. The only commandments that we know about in the Bible, the Ten Commandments... Yeah. It was Jesus who gave them to Moses. We talked about that. Yeah. So if you keep my commandments, if you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. We can't disregard his commandments. And when you think about a command, you can't give a command without s saying it. Like there's no command that you'd be like, you, you have to verbalize it. And that's one of my biggest problems about Sunday, the, the justification for Sunday. They say it's now a command because it's like still a Sunday and a Sabbath and all this stuff. Of course, Breaker doesn't actually say it's, Sunday's the Sabbath, but as we saw in the Jesuit document in the Catholic Church, they say that it is. But in order for a command to exist, don't you have to see somebody has to verbalize the command? Where was the change? Where's and it the can't verbalization? be a person. No. 
it has, has to, to be God. God. Just like the commands, keep my commandments. Yeah. Well, then someone else can't come down and say, well, I've changed Jesus's commandments. But there is an organization that said they've done that. That's the Catholic Church. And just because Paul in that place only named five, that's Paul. Yeah. That's another human. So does that mean that because he, a human, didn't mention the other five, that we don't have to keep them? That would be ludicrous. Yeah. We're supposed to take our commands straight from God. And if, you know, there was a prophet and they received a vision, they passed all the tests, and yes, they're a true prophet, and they said, this is the thing. But then we'd have a problem because God says, I never change. That's right. So then we have a contradiction already. Yeah. And, and God, there's no variableness or shadow of turning, or he's, he's the same yesterday, Jesus Christ, yesterday, this, today, forever. So to me, it's it's like you 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 have to have this command. It has to be by God or one of his representatives. And there's no command changing it. There's no command voiding it. At no point was there a voice of God with a command mm -hmm. to to change anything. So when it, that that to me like sticks out at what where's the command to to keep Sunday? If Jesus rose and said something, I would take a look at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I'd be like, hmm. If he rose from the dead and said, because I have risen from the dead, the, no, the Sabbath is now on Sunday to commemorate, now not creation, to commemorate my raising from the dead, I'm, I'm there. I'm on board. I'm at least, you know, now we're talking. Yeah. There's not a single verse anywhere. And the weakness of the first day argument when just looking at scripture is so poor that I'm honestly wondering how people can look at this and arrive at a Sunday conclusion. I, I just don't understand. And it says here, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So the Apostle Paul tells us, no, you don't have to do anything on Saturday. Well, Pause for a second. Mm -hmm. So he, here again, he mixes up the different laws mm -hmm. because even as he read it, if you heard, it says Sabbath days, not the seventh day, mm -hmm. the Sabbath days, which are, what did he say? A shadow of things to come. Exactly. So these are the ceremonial ones. And we, he, I don't, he doesn't know that there's a difference between ceremonial and weekly Sabbath observance. So we're going to walk through what the difference is. Key question, what did Paul mean, let no man judge you about the Sabbath? And we have our key verses. Here we go in Colossians 2, 16 and 17. So let no one judge you in food or drink or regarding festival. So I want let's let's look at what's happening here. Let no man judge you. So what Paul's going up against here is legalism. People are creating this legalistic structure where your holiness is based on your feast keeping and your ritualistic purity and, and all the ceremonial Sabbaths. So we see that he's talking about judging and legalism. And so people are trying to eat and keep these new moons and Sabbaths for their own salvation. They're not taking the righteousness of Christ. This is to, to replace Christ. Yep. Then it says, or regarding festival or a new moon or Sabbath. That right there tells us which Sabbath we're dealing with. Yep. It's putting it with festival and new moon. This has nothing to do with the weekly Sabbath established at creation. And in fact, it tells us that because it says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substances of Christ. And these Sabbaths were not necessarily on the seventh day. No, they weren't. They could be any day of the week. They could be part of the festival, a ritual Sabbath festival. And so we'll, we'll look more at that. We see Hebrews 10.1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers uh, thereunto perfect. So we see again, like this, these, these. When you see the shadow, this almost is a dead giveaway that we're dealing with this ceremonial and ritual law that was nailed to the cross. Because when it's saying shadow, it's a shadow of what? Christ, which is the fullness of the right. things to come. So we see this is lumped in with festivals. We see that this is all shadows. You've never heard the Ten Commandments referred to as a shadow of anything. Right. There's never, the, mm -hmm. no one can connect those two, but you always see the shadow in reference to that which was nailed to the cross in the law of Moses. So 
What was the purpose of these two Sabbaths? The ceremonial Sabbath was a part of the ceremonial law given to Israel for their religious observances. They were appointed times for various feasts, sacrifices, religious festivals, and all of these things. You know, the festival of first fruits, the feast of trumpets, all of these things all pointed to Christ. And if, you know, if he had a leg to stand on, he could say, oh, well, if they're really legalists, then they would be feast keepers too. Yeah. But we're not feast keepers. Right. We're not telling people to keep feasts. So it, again, it takes away this idea that we're like advocating for keeping something that we know is not valid anymore. Now, the Sabbath of the seventh day. This is part of the Ten Commandments. It's part of God's moral law. As we say, you can't like pick and choose. It was instituted at creation as a day of rest, and the worship is meant to focus on God as the creator and that it's a sign that we're his covenant people. Yeah. Like they're they're totally different. They weren't appointed to the weekly. This uh, is a sign between if you are God's people, not if you're Israel and Jews. Mm -hmm. If you are part of God's people or not part of God's people. That's right. Or else Adam and Eve wouldn't have had to keep the Sabbath. That's right. The very first Sabbath was kept in Eden. Yeah. And all the Sabbaths, all the, until then, until, until the fall, right? So like there wasn't just the first Sabbath and then the fall. Like yeah. they had time and Sabbaths that were kept to honor this, this memorial uh, for creation. Seventh day Sabbath. Seventh day Sabbath, yeah. yeah. And uh, there were not um, feasts and shadows of things in right. Eden because they had not fallen. Yeah. All of those pieces were just to point forward to Christ yeah. to begin with. So the original one, there wasn't even the ceremonial Sabbath. It was just your regular weekly yeah. Sabbath. Now, the frequency, the ceremonial Sabbaths occurred on specific dates throughout the year, such as Passover, Pentecost, Feast of Tabernacles. The Sabbath of the seventh day occurred every week from Friday sunset to Saturday sunset, following the pattern set by God at creation. So they, they serve different purposes, and the, the one they're talking about is, is connected to the shadow, not the, the, the moral yeah. law. Ceremonial Sabbaths about fulfillment. The ceremonial Sabbaths came along with other ceremonial laws. They found their fulfillment in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and were shadow and types of, that pointed forward to the redemptive work of the Messiah, where the Sabbath of the seventh day is a, as it says, perpetual reminder of God's creative power yeah. and rest in the completed works. At no point does Robert Breaker in any of the material that I've seen him share make the point that the Sabbath was meant to remember the creator and the work of creation. Right. He just seems to think that it's like this rest thing, but I've never heard him equate it to acknowledging God as the creator on his holy day. The biggest point of the Sabbath was not just to be lazy. Mm. And and that's almost how it's portrayed. It's just a lazy day. Mm -hmm. You know, just don't move, don't do this, don't do anything, yeah, just sit around. And just, you know. And that's not what the Sabbath was for. It's it not. wasn't to rest away the Sabbath and just sleep it away because you didn't sleep on the rest of the days of the week. Exactly. Exactly. It, it, and uh, we'll look more at that as well. So uh, I, I want to present this from Rome's challenge because, again, it, it very much like lays down that uh, they understand from Rome's view, they understand that anybody keeping Sunday has, has decided against the Bible. Regardless of if you think that statement's true or not, it is just an objective reality that the choosing Sunday is picking against what the Bible teaches and for what papal Rome teaches. And here they say as much. Our modern Pharisees, the Protestant churches, have never once in their lives kept a true Sabbath, which their divine master kept to his dying day, and which his apostles kept after his example for 30 years after, were it according to the sacred record. We have shown that no greater contradiction ever existed than their theory and practice. We have proved that neither their biblical ancestors nor themselves has ever kept a Sabbath in their lives. That's a, that's a very strong yeah. statement. We'll skip here. It says, the, uh, the history of the world cannot present a more stupid specimen of dereliction of principle than the keeping of Sunday rather than Saturday as Sabbath. The teacher, the Bible, demands emphatically in every page that the law of Sabbath be observed every week by all recognizing it as the only infallible teacher, whilst the disciples of that teacher, Protestant churches, have not once for over 300 years observed the divine precept. God's written word enjoins his worship to be observed on Saturday 
absolutely, repeatedly, and most emphatically with a positive threat of death to him who disobeys. It's, it's pretty clear what they think. And, and they're the ones who made Sunday to begin with. And I know Breaker says, no, uh, you know, the apostles, we're going to dive into all that, the whole first day stuff. So let's keep, let's keep uh, chipping away here. For us today. And if someone comes along and judges you and says, oh, you got the mark of the beast because you're not keeping the Sabbath. Paul says, you don't listen to that person. Let me show you the command in the Old Testament. All right? You get into a mess if you mix with this false denomination. I, I want to just emphasize something here. We're trying, we're trying to do this as respectfully as possible. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe that that sort of an action is how Christ would have spoken about someone who is in error. Because we're trying to do this because we believe that people need to hear the truth, right? And if he believes that people need to hear the truth, he needs to do that in a humble and truthful manner as well mm -hmm. and not... Um, trying to turn people away who he could influence if he acted in a different way. And for me, there's no saying maybe he met Adventists that do that. And if he M has, maybe that is let real. me just I say, I want to apologize on their behalf because nobody should be saying that, nor is it what we believe. And we're going to dive into the Mark of the Beast a little bit, not too in deep, but just to show that no Adventist, studied Adventist believes that a Protestant has the Mark of the Beast because they're going to church on Sunday. Yeah. And we're going to show the exact quotes that shows when we think that happens, why we think it happens. And unfortunately, if Robert Breaker has met Adventists like that, well, it's really unfortunate because uh, it's, it looks poorly upon us, and I hope it doesn't turn off our brothers and sisters in Sunday churches who will eventually see the truth and come out uh, because they think that people are, are saying and, and demonstrative like that. Yeah. But if people haven't really come up to him like that, then this is a very strange way to try to reach hearts and minds. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm hoping that um, he actually has met people like that, so that way at least gives some justification. Uh, but it's not what a well-studied Bible Adventist will, how they'll yeah. react or how they'll talk. It teaches, you've got to keep the law, you've got to keep the Sabbath. And I got to question, I have to question, do they even read the Bible? Do you know what the Bible says about the Sabbath? The Bible tells you that you had to keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament... And then the Bible tells you when it comes to the Sabbath, if you don't keep the Sabbath, it's the death penalty. Did you know that? Did you know that under the law, they had to keep the Sabbath because if they didn't, it was, and it was over. So we're going to show a little something here. Was it just the Sabbath that if you broke, the penalty was death? It was all the commandments. Last I checked, it says in Romans, for the wages of sin is death. Uh, uh, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. So let's just take his argument. Yeah. That the Sabbath is the one that has a death penalty. So that means the only way you can sin is by breaking the Sabbath, hmm. because the wages of sin is death. Mm. And breaking the Sabbath, you die. So any way this argument it, it doesn't hold water. No. The wages of sin is death. It wasn't just death for those who didn't keep the Sabbath. The Bible says, all who sin shall die. Yeah. It is the breaking of all the commandments that lead to death, not just the Sabbath in the Old Testament. The soul that sins dies, whether in the New Testament or the Old. Yeah. It does not matter. And I think he's really just like grabbing on. Does it say? Yes, it says for those who don't uh, keep the Sabbath in the Old Testament, it is death. Uh, but again, it's like there's no difference between that breaking of a sin, or the law for sin or yeah. another one. The the wages of sin is death. Look at what happened to the prophets of Baal. That's right. They all were killed. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't the Sabbath they broke. Mm -hmm. That was idols and other gods. So, it, yeah, it was more than just the Sabbath. It was all the commandments. Yeah, and I, I really feel like it's a, it's a bit... Um, disingenuous to just say that it was just the Sabbath that led to death. I mean, that's just really ignoring the reality of the situation. It was the death penalty. Let me read that to you in Exodus chapter 31. And I want you to pay attention to what the Scripture itself says. Because it says that the Sabbath is for Israel. 
It does not say that the Sabbath is for the church. I want you to get a hold of that. You've got to see this. I deal with this all the time in emails and phone calls and meeting people. Many of them go to a false church, which was started by a man named Miller, in an insane asylum. Yeah, you look it up. You study that. Seventh-day Adventism. It literally started in a sanatorium by a man who didn't know how to rightly divide his Bible, and he's trying to get people here back up under. So that is almost laughable because he said a man named Miller in an insane asylum and uh, then says it was literally a sanitarium. And obviously he does not know what a sanitarium is because it is not an insane asylum. <laughs> it is a natural health center. Mm -hmm. And it was not started in a sanitarium either. And Miller, it wasn't part of the sanitariums. No. Uh, they were a totally separate thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's just grossly mis misunderstanding. As we've seen as most, he said, oh, we're righteousness by works. We show five quotes that shows we're righteousness by faith. Only Christ works alone. We can go through the Sabbath and the mark of the beast and the first day. And, the, and we just see that everything so far that we're trying to show side by side is just a miscategorization of what the reality is, which then... If I'm like a person watching, it, it undermines my like faith in what he says as a, as a Bible teacher or a pastor. Because I feel like even if you don't agree with everything we're saying and you still have some of his pieces, I think we've shown enough that shows that what he's painted Seventh-day Adventism as is not an accurate picture whatsoever. So where does that line stop? Is it just with Adventists and everything else is perfect? Or is this like thinking slipping over in and creating errors and then giving people a false sense of security that they're listening to somebody who knows what they're talking about? Yeah. And then you like, oh, well, I'm good. I'll just watch my breaker video. I understand what's going to happen at the end of time and who's involved. And every single piece he has is, is wrong uh, when you put it under the weight of Bible scrutiny, just like he's wrong about the assumptions he's made about us, even though he said he's read the books. And again, I contend that that's probably a half truth. He's probably looked at a couple passages and not really looked at the larger body of work, which then how can you possibly make a determination without doing that? If he did real research on the beginning of Adventism, he would not find that Miller was in an assailant asylum that, because that would not be written anywhere because it's not even a half truth. No, and even if there were people with mental health issues in sanitariums, that doesn't make it a, like an insane they, they weren't people who were starting the church and writing down theology. No, they were treating people who had problems. They weren't even necessarily Adventists. Mm -hmm. All right. What would that entail? Well, Exodus chapter 31, let's read verse 12 through 18. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of who? Israel. Saying, Verily my Sabbath ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. So it's for Israel, not for the church. Everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. The death penalty is what the law says for those that don't keep the Sabbath. Well, I like to go garage sailing on Saturday. Are other Christians going to put me to death for doing something on a Saturday? Saturday is the Sabbath. Yet today there is a group... I just want to acknowledge that he knows that the seventh day is the Sabbath. So like he, this is, shows that it's different than the Catholic Church and that he's saying Sunday's just a completely different thing. It's not Sabbath. And also I want to add, if that was still binding, then just because he wouldn't want to die for garage sailing doesn't mean he wouldn't. Mm -hmm. So and even then, like we said, it wasn't only the Sabbath. That was the death penalty. It was all the commandments. That mm -hmm. was the death penalty. So it's really an empty argument here. I think so too. That say you must keep the Sabbath and that going to church is the mark of the beast. For those that don't know, that's what you call the Seventh-day Adventists. What do they do, though? They claim to keep the law, and they claim to keep the Sabbath. But do they really keep the Sabbath? Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Because I've looked at these people, and I've studied what they believe, I've read their books, and I cannot be one of them. 
because I know my Bible too well. The first thing the law says is to be under the law of Moses, you have to be circumcised. I've met many of these Adventists, these Seventh-day people in my life, and the first thing I do is I say, hey, well, so you, you believe in keeping the law? Yes, we do. Have you ever been circumcised? Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, have you ever been circumcised? N no. Okay, well, let's, let's take care of that right now. And yet you're bragging, oh, I keep the Sabbath. You're not even keeping the law that said you're to be circumcised. Again, he does not understand that we're talking about the law of God, not the law of Moses. And I just think, you know, it's slightly childish to be doing these, like, antics. Let's say his point was even right. Is there not a better way to achieve the same uh, educational point? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's like he's, he's about to go through all the things that you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath in the ceremonial laws of Moses. Yeah. But you don't ever see any of that language tied to the, the fourth commandment of God, even though in that uh, ritual law, there were there were things that we could use to learn how to keep the Sabbath. But you have people now, even, even some Jews today, that won't turn on their lights. Yeah. But they'll go do all sorts of other sin, but they think not turning their lights on or off is somehow adding to their own righteousness. There's no righteousness but Christ's righteousness. And so a lot of what he's about to go through is just uh, a misunderstanding of how we understand the Sabbath yeah. and the law. It's really sad. God gave the law to Moses, and they hadn't had it very long, and the next thing you know, they're disobeying it. <laughs> and how can they claim they are keeping it when they're starting fires and they're leaving their homes and they're not resting? You see, the Sabbath is to rest. That means you stay at home and you do nothing. That's, well, that's obviously not true, because pretty much every place where it talks about Jesus and the Sabbath, he's out going to the going synagogue to, yeah. to teach and learn, uh, not learn, but to sit and listen. Uh, and when you listen to the uh, Paul, which he loves to talk about Paul, every Sabbath Paul is in the synagogue teaching Jew and Greek. Yeah. Uh, there couldn't be anything further from the truth that you're just supposed to sit at home all day and do nothing. And do nothing. I mean, that's just... We're, one, we're supposed to commune with God. We're supposed to uh, uh, like see his work of creation. Yeah. And they were supposed to go to the sanctuary, to the temple, to worship God. Unless they lived in the temple, then that would not be possible. Mm -hmm. So this is not uh, biblical. No, even. it's not. No, and it's ignoring the very real evidence of all the people in the New Testament who, whenever you see the Sabbath, they were going to worship at the synagogue. And so the rest isn't just physical rest. It's resting from all the cares and toils of the world to just realize that your Creator knows you, loves you, cares for you, knows what you need before you even ask, and is going to provide. And you're sitting there on, on Sabbath acknowledging, saying, God, I trust you. I don't need to worry about the world. You told me, do not fear. And because you've given me this sign as the Creator, I'm going to hold it so you know that I'm acknowledging where all my blessings are coming from. I've been as nice as I could today. But I'm very, very sad to see this denomination existing in the world today and how hypocritical its teachings are. And it's sad to me to see how many people are sucked into such a cult. Because to go back to that law is to reject Jesus and to be adulterer and to say, no, I don't want to be free and have a blessing. No, I want to be under bondage and be cursed. So, do you even rest? Are you one of these people that goes to church on Saturday thinking you're pleasing God and yet you're not even doing what it says? It says stay home and rest and don't start a fire. And yet you run out, broom, start up your car, start a fire and go and you, you're, you left your house. The Sabbath is the original lockdown and it was for every week. For the Sabbath was the original lockdown? Yeah. What a ridiculous way to put that. Uh, what you know, it's just disregarding the holiness and joy. Like when you think of lockdown, do you think of something positive? Definitely not. <laughs> not something peaceful. No, not a. But what Jesus said, "Man was made for the or, uh, Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath." It's a blessing to you. I'm the Lord of yeah. the Sabbath, and here he's just saying that it's basically like a lockdown. Also, he keeps emphasizing how much the law is a curse and bondage yeah. and you're a slave 
But then he says, under the church and the spirit of grace, we still don't sin. That's right. And we still keep the law. It so then no sense. You, you can't keep the law if the law is curse and bondage and not be in bondage. Yeah. And it's just, you know, the it's it's more an emotional plea than it is a logical, factual, biblical plea. I agree. And like we said before, right? We have to have that servant mentality, that utter humility, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And and like when we I don't get the sense that he wants Adventists to be saved. I can't say that because I can't see his heart and mind, but just the way he's acting and the way I genuinely want Robert Breaker and his family and those he prays for to be in heaven. I genuinely want us all to be there. I, I, I would much rather have that than have Satan have one single yeah. more soul to add to the, the, the broken heartedness of Jesus when he died on the cross from a broken heart. So like, if this does get get back to those who know Breaker or Breaker himself, I hope he can realize that we are not doing this out of malice or uh, debate, but out of love. We genuinely want him to be saved, and and I hope he feels that way towards us too. And we're simply just uh, comparing scripture with scripture. What does the Bible say? Let us reason together. This is us reasoning mm -hmm. and trying to be reasonable without being um, over the top or dramatic or demonstrative in any way. And it was a time for them to go rest physically. And I talked about how... Okay, just uh, as a kind of a note, we are now going over to the next video of his, which talks specifically, not necessarily why it's not Sabbath, but why it is Sunday. Yeah. And um, before we do that, it's probably good for us to go through the purpose of the Sabbath. Uh, because he doesn't touch on this as much, and we're going to switch over to more sun Sunday stuff, so I was kind of waiting to, to jump into this piece. But uh, I think it's pretty clear now after watching that that he is not acknowledging a lot of the things we've already talked about, so we're going to work through this pretty quickly rather than go through it too in depth. So the purpose of the Sabbath. Now let's just see what the Bible says for itself. On the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. So how much of us is in that verse? Zero. Right. It's him. It's God. It's his work. It's his finish. It's his rest. There's, this is not about us. It said, and then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. So who blessed it and sanctified it? Jesus. Yeah. Well, because Jesus. this was actually Jesus. Right. Exactly. Who is also God. Because that in it, he had rested from all the works which God created and made. These are the generations of the heaven and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. So we see clearly it's related by God, sanctified, set aside about creation, not about resurrection. As much as we love the resurrection, it's just not about that. Yeah. It's not up to us whether it is or it isn't. Okay, and then we see the sign, uh, Sabbath is a sign, God is the creator of all. And we see Exodus, it says, the Lord made the heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. Well, in Revelation 14, it says, the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, worship him that made the heaven, earth, and the sea. Like beginning and the end, it is, it is describing the same thing. Yep. Sabbath not anywhere in the entire New Testament. Yet in Mark, it says, he says to them, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And I think this is probably one of the most underplayed verses in the whole New Testament because it is speaking, as we're going to see, John 1, 3, for people who maybe saw the earlier episodes and we say Jesus is the one they're creating. Well, why do you guys say that? How do you know Jesus was there at the creation? John 1, 3, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. That's yeah. talking about Jesus. Hebrews 1, 2, he that in the last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Right. Could it be any more clear than that? So it's like he... The creator is Jesus. Exactly, by the will of his Father. So, and, and, and this is not like an assumption, or Ellen White says this, by whom also he made the worlds. So Jesus was there. That's why he said, hey guys, Sabbath was made for, for man. I am the Lord of the Sabbath. I was there at the I beginning of the world. You, I, I made this saying. for you. And here's this blessing. So I'm telling you now, I'm also the Lord of this blessing that yeah. I brought to you. And I don't think people really realize how much he's saying it's not in there. He's saying 
it is in there. I'm God of the Sabbath, and it's a blessing I've given you. I kept it my whole life. My apostles kept it my whole life. There's no direct command to change it. Yeah. I just don't, I don't... How could you get more clear? And then, again, like we read already, John 14, 15, if ye love me, keep my commandments. And he's saying mine because he's the one who gave them to Moses. He gave it to Moses at Sinai. He gave it to Adam and Eve in, in, in Eden. And Sinai, is a, we may have, I may have left this out, but Sinai was not a, a new giving of the law. It was a reiteration of yeah. the law that had been forgotten in their time in Egypt. Yeah. Uh, so it's like... It's not. It wasn't new at that time. As and you gave they some examples. They weren't supposed to, to kill before then. No. <laughs> Nor were they supposed to have other gods before then, or worship idols before then. So it's like it was just a reiteration at Sinai, not a, yeah. a giving the first time. The Sabbath was embodied in the law given from Sinai, but it was not the first made known as the day of rest. Then first made known as the day of rest. The people of Israel had a knowledge of it before they came to Sinai. On the way thither, the Sabbath was kept. As you said, like he went and said, yeah. Pharaoh, let my people go to keep the Sabbath. Yeah. They hadn't even gone to Sinai yet. When, when some profaned it, the Lord reproved them, saying, How long refuse ye to keep my commandments and my laws? The Sabbath was not for Israel merely, but for the world. It had made known to man in Eden, and like the other precepts of the Decalogue, it is of imperishable obligation. No other institution which was committed to the Jews tended so fully to distinguish them from surrounding nations as did the Sabbath. Time out. Do you remember when we just uh, did the episode on uh, the, the the Jesuit document? And it said that the Judeo-Christian tradition, this stuck out and distinguished yeah. them from the rest. And we're seeing the same language from separate sources in different yeah. points of time, that this, this is a distinguishing feature. And it is. Look, the fact that Breaker is talking about Seventh-day Adventists is because... It's a distinguishing factor. It is. It makes you different. It, it makes you look different. Yeah, as it did the Jews for the entirety of their time wandering around, getting settled in Canaan. It was like this mark that showed that they were different from the heathen world. God designed that its observance should be designated them as his worshipers. It was to be a token of their separation from idolatry and their connection with the true God. But in order to keep the Sabbath holy, men must themselves be holy. Through faith, through faith... They must be partakers of the righteousness of Christ. So even here she's saying, he said like, oh, the Adventists are uh, saying to keep this day because now look at me, I'm keeping the Sabbath. I've never met any Seventh-day Adventist that's come up and said, well, I'm going to heaven because I kept the Sabbath. Yeah. I've never heard it. Maybe there are, but I've never heard anyone say that. We're not doing this to, to for our own righteousness. We're doing this as a reflection of our faith. I kept the Sabbath. You have to let me in now. That's not how it works. That's right. So it's like you can be a Sabbath keeper and still not be uh, uh, faithful in Christ. Yeah. And, so, and you could be a non-Sabbath keeper who's none aware and be found faithful in Christ. And we're going to talk about what changes in the future for that dynamic to not be like that anymore. But as we sit here today, that is the dynamic. The Sabbath institution, which originated in Eden, as we've talked about at length now, is as old as the world itself. It was observed by the patriarchs from creation down. The very first words of the fourth commandment is remember the Sabbath. And that always, you know, as I started really researching, that always stuck out with me. The only one of all the commandments that starts out with remember. And that's the one we want to forget. And that's the one he wants to get rid of. And all other nine he seems to be fine with. The law of ten commandments of which the Sabbath forms a part, Christ declares till heaven and earth pass. One jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, so long as the heavens and the earth endures to the Sabbath as the sign of the Creator's power. So again, God designs that the Sabbath shall direct the minds of men to the contemplation of his created works. We're supposed to look at him as the Creator. And so, you know, as we're starting to paint this picture, hopefully now others can see when we read quotes like this, why it bothers us so much because we just read this whole thing about how it's a blessing and it's actually Jesus who gave it at creation. And then you see something like this. The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by their divine right. Well, wouldn't that upset you if someone came and said, I'm changing your God's law because yeah. I said so? Then, no. I mean, anybody who worships the God of the Bible, this should upset because it's just going in the face of God. Absolutely. It's blasphemy. It is blasphemy, because they're saying they have this divine, infallible authority given yep. to her by her founder, Jesus, yet it goes in the face of Jesus. I never heard Jesus say, I'm starting this church called the Catholicism. No. 
and the whole upon this rock will I found the rock is Jesus. It's not Peter. We could do a whole thing about that, but yeah. Um, so I find that it, it's very interesting. We've put a Catholic doctrine up there that shows how could any Protestants keep Sunday? What a dereliction of theological understanding. And then over here says, you know what? It is a dereliction, but guess who changed it? We did. Yeah. Whether you like it or not, whether you said it was the Sunday first uh, day was being kept by apostles and Jesus rose, none of that matters because we know the Bible says something different. And if you're holding Sunday, it's because we have told you to. Yeah. They couldn't have made it more clear. And as we saw last time, the observance of Sunday thus comes to be an ecclesiastical law entirely distinct from the law of the Sabbath observance. Thus, it is impossible to find in the New Testament the slightest inference by the Savior or his apostles with the original Sabbath. And then it just goes on to say, uh, the keeping of, of which was done for 30 years after his death, as the Acts of the Apostles has abundantly testified. We've read this a few times now, yeah. but it's in there because I really want those who are keeping Sunday to try to absorb the severity of the situation here, how big a deal this really is. Yeah. Yeah, and we have another one here. It says the most glaring contradiction, as we just said, in the sacrilegious rejection yeah. of the most positive. But we have demonstrated that it is the Bible against their Sabbath. So I think hopefully it's coming clear to those watching that uh, you can believe Sunday, you can do so, but you're doing so against the tremendous weight of evidence that is saying, nah, that's not what it's supposed to be. Yeah. And now we carry on into Sunday. Saturday was for the Old Testament, and then the New Testament is Sunday. And so we that are Christians, we remember the first day of the week rather than the last day of the week. And there's a reason for that. It's in the Bible. You look at any calendar, Sunday is the first day of the week. So Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Saturday is the seventh day or the Sabbath in the Old Testament. And so we talked about that last time. And I didn't get to talk much about Sunday and why church on Sunday. I just talked about Saturday and what the Bible said about Saturday. And a lot of people have emailed and asked, Hey, Brother Breaker, would you talk more about Sunday? In that teaching, though, I did mention that there are people out there who claim that going to church on Sunday is a mark of the beast, or the mark of the beast, according to them. If you got your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 13. Because... When I hear outlandish claims like, if you go to church on Sunday, you've taken the mark of the beast, I go, what? And as always, I want to go to the Bible and find out from the Word of God itself if what they're saying is true. So this is entitled today, Is Sunday Worship in the Bible? And we're going to go to Acts chapter 15 here in a moment as well. But there are people out there who talk about Sunday and say that going to Sunday is the mark of the beast. Now, if you read Revelation chapter 13, and we get to the end of this, I'll read a couple of verses. But just scan down there through in Revelation chapter 13. It talks about those that have the mark of the beast. It's in their right hand or in their forehead. And they can't buy or sell without that mark. Now, I go to church on Sunday. I don't have anything in my hand or in my forehead. So I don't know what these people are talking about. And I'm able to buy and sell even on Sunday. So who are these people that run around and say, don't go to church on Sunday, it's the mark of the beast, and it's evil, and all this stuff? Well, we'll look at that today. But how on earth is going to church? So when we... He's saying a lot about the mark of the beast here, which is an entire big study in itself. Mm -hmm. But about this mark in the hand and in the forehead... And it says, you know, I don't have a mark in my hand or in my forehead because I go to church and I'm still able to buy or sell even on Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, the thing is, with this topic here, uh, now I don't know, but I don't believe that he even thinks the mark of the beast is enforced yet. No. But he's implying that Adventists are saying that the mark of the beast is enforced yet. Mm -hmm. So even by his principles, he should not be doing a statement like that, look, I don't have a mark here or here. Mm -hmm. He should say, okay, well, maybe I'll... If, if I get a mark by here, when I think the mark will be enforced, <laughs> you know, or at least that argument, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because nowhere in 
the Bible or Adventism, does it apply the Mark of the Beast happening to right now? No. And we're going to look at that. He's going to go more into this later. So we're going to kind of let this breeze by, and he's going to kind of bring it up a little bit more later, and we're going to walk through because he's going to say, Adventists say that you have the Mark of the Beast, you go on Sunday, and we're going to show why that's yeah. not, not true. Church on a specific day, the Mark of the Beast. And how is it you can't buy or sell? We buy and sell on Sunday. A lot of people do. We don't have anything in our right hand or our forehead. But some claim that Sunday worship came from Catholicism. Now get your Bible out and turn to Acts chapter 15. And I want to tell you what these people teach. And the outlandish lie that they give. And I'm going to show you how this lie that they founded their religion on crumbles under truth. And under simple scrutiny from the Bible. This is what they claim. They claim that Sunday worship came from Catholicism. And you can look this up online and you know, type in, is, is Sunday worship the mark of the beast? And they'll tell you that around 180 A.D., well, that'd be way out here, around 180 A.D., they claim there was a fella named Victor, and he was a bishop, Victor I. And they say that Victor I came along and that old Victor the First, he went to a guy named Clement, and he said, Hey, Clement, you know, I think we should start worshiping on Sunday instead of Saturday. And I just think for some reason we just didn't make that up, going to church on Sunday as a thing. And uh, the guy said, Yeah, I think you're right. Now, they claim that the pagans worshiped on Sunday as well. And so what they claim is that they took paganism and mixed it together. And in the Catholic Church, a lot of that did happen. But did they mix Sunday worship? Did they just out of the blue make up, hey, let's have church on Sunday? So he acknowledges that paganism and Christianity, he said some of that didn't happen. Not some. A whole lot of paganism was mixed with Christian yeah. principles. And you just go into their cathedrals today or look at the priest garb or look at what the Pope's wearing or where he sits is a laundry list of things. Anybody who denies that paganism, not even Catholicism denies that paganism is part of the the Catholic faith, yeah. uh, or at least originated from. So I, I don't think that he thinks that we've just like, they just decided that Sunday at some point would be a day. But as we kind of talked about briefly in the other episode, the first Sunday kind of reference in Christian relation to the Lord's Day was the Justin Martyr stuff, who's now in a, uh, in a Jesuit temple in Malta. And that's where Justin Martyr sits today. So it was like the early pieces were birthed pretty close to after Jesus's death, these issues were coming up. And if somebody actually goes and reads the seven churches in Revelation, it tells you what happened to the church and how each church struggled with various yeah. things. And one of these doctrines was negating the law of God and false worship uh, days. Yeah. But my guess is he doesn't probably know that the seven churches are seven eras of churches and how those eras match up. So it's hard to blame him for something he doesn't know. But it's, it seems to me very clear that like uh, the Sunday issue started coming up early and just evolved and evolved and evolved and kind of typified by the, that 190 and then the Constantinian decree and all that. And what they do is they say that this guy came along and he says, well, let's have church on Sunday because in reality they were worshiping the sun god Helios or whatever his name was in, in, in their religion. What's interesting is he says they're worship, worshiping Helios, but we just saw two quotes from the Catholic Church that says, we changed Sabbath. So it wasn't necessarily like pagan Rome that changed it, the solemnity to Sabbath. It was, the, it was already the Catholic Church by that point. They're not yeah. worshiping Helios. They say they're worshiping Jesus Christ. They say they're worshiping the God of heaven. So like even his timeline doesn't really make all that much sense because it says the Catholic Church changed the date and he's saying yeah. it's a pagan Helios deal. In the old Greek, it was Helios. Then they claim that around 321 AD, a guy named Constantine, Constantine the first, passed a law that said you can only have church on Sunday. And they say because of this, 
That is the mark of the beast because that's the false Roman papal church. Well, I'm not a papist. I'm not a Romanist. I'm not a Catholic. But I believe on going to church on Sunday. And I don't believe it because those people that far past Christ said so. I go to the Bible itself and I go to Jesus and I go to the apostles. Especially Paul. And I look in the Bible and I ask this question. Did the apostles and Jesus and Paul, did they come together on Sunday? Was it to honor the Son? Or is Sunday worship a made-up thing by Catholicism and it came from paganism? Which is true. Well, they will tell you, if you go to church on Sunday, they claim it's the mark of the beast. Okay. We're going to scrutinize that today. We're going to look into this claim and see if it has a leg to stand on. Or if, in fact, in the Bible itself, they did meet on Sunday, way before these fellows came along. And if we find that, then we know one thing. These people are in error. These people are in false doctrine. These people are lying to us. So the fact that someone met earlier than who he's saying is pagans on Sunday, that gives the validity. Just because someone met yeah, And that's earlier. the problem I have is like, like we've talked about now, all he's saying is they met. Where's all this pomp and circumstance and commands and God's saying this and, ch and you know, telling people what to do, and now he's just reduced it to meeting up? Is that what the Sabbath has been reduced to? Is just meeting up in a couple of verses that don't say anything about Sabbath worship at all is now you can kick to the side the volume of both history and scriptural text that says otherwise. It really is is crazy, and he's obviously very passionate about it. But why does he choose the argument that has so little evidence over the one that has so much? And that's where the the conflict with tradition really starts to. Jesus come from. was there. He could have said. Here is what you need to do now. Mm -hmm. He did to everything else. He said, I do not come to destroy that, but to fulfill it. Let me tell you the actual commandments. Even if you look at a woman, even if you hate someone, mm -hmm. you've killed them. Mm -hmm. He didn't take the law and diminish it. He made it that much more intense. Yep. He did the opposite of that. Yep. He expanded upon, and Paul said as much. I thought I was a keeper of the law until I realized that it wasn't the letter, but the spirit of the law. And once I realized that I had basically broken every commandment, like I, I saw my, Paul says he saw himself like differently after that, because Jesus really impressed the depth and the importance of yeah. our relationship to it. And the reality is, if he wants the argument that people met on Sunday before this and you know the apostles did well i'm not saying that the apostles worshiped on sunday but before them meeting on sunday there was others meeting on sunday too yeah there was all the pagans but there was also people of the jews where it talks about in ezekiel their face was towards the sun and they were doing all these things backs to the temple and face towards the so sun. so yeah. they were doing the exact thing that they were not supposed to do, yeah. which was told as it was an abomination. Yeah. The worst abomination in all of Israel is sun worship. Yeah. And go back to our first or second one uh, on this topic where we really dove in. Yeah. That it's that Why is sun worship so bad? Is because it actually breaks all of the commandments uh, towards God. Because it removes him as creator, because the Sabbath is what acknowledges him as creator, mm -hmm. it all just piggybacks on there. Yep. And... <laughs> Well, we'll he'll he'll continue here, and we'll keep taking a look. Yep. And we are to depart from people who lie. So, is it true that the idea of meeting on Sunday was made up hundreds of years after Jesus, or did the early apostles meet on Sunday? See, they claim that this guy Constantine he got his little council together, and they said, well. Council of Nicaea, I guess it was 325 AD and all this. So they're saying that it's the council of here that produced Sunday worship. Do you know where the first council is of the early church? It's in Acts chapter 15. 
And in Acts 15, you have the first Christian council of people getting together. And in Acts chapter 15, this is the first council. I'll just say, too, like even in the Sunday proclamation, there was still a command from the Catholic Church. There was still something verbalized or vocalized in a way that's saying, we've done this by our authority. And here, like, there's no... There's never any transfer from any of God's representatives. Like, I'm still waiting for the smoking gun where it actually says this anywhere in the text. And it's never produced. Even to the point when they did switch it, they still made a text that said we're the ones that did it. So where's all the text that says that God changed this? They can never produce it. It does not exist. And we find something very, very revealing. Isn't that interesting? But yet, today, people run around and say, you can't be saved if you go to church on Sunday. It's the mark of the beast. You've got to keep the Sabbath. You've got to... And you're like, where's that in the Bible? They can't show you. So he's going to talk more about the mark of the beast. He's going to talk about uh, what Adventists teach about uh, what we say people have the mark of the beast now. And we're going to show why that's not the case. But this is not the place where we can do a three-hour deep dive on how we can arrive, what the mark of the beast is, when it becomes the mark of the beast. So for people who are interested in that, go back and watch some of our older material. We've covered, we've done a number of episodes on the mark of the beast and how it arrives and all the pieces around it. So please go back and watch some of those, especially the ones we did on Revelation 13 in America, the false prophet. So we're just going to touch on it lightly here now. So Revelation 7, 3 indicates that God also has this mark, and we get the same kind of language in that it's going on the a forehead. It's called the seal of God, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. foreheads. Okay, now let's compare that to the mark of the beast. And I, before you do, I just want to emphasize to in Revelation 7, it says, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees. And those are figures as well. That's not literally earth, sea, and trees. Mm -hmm. Because later on in Revelation, what does sea represent? Represents people. What do trees represent? It represents people. Mm -hmm. The earth is an unpopulated area. So it's saying don't touch the unpopulated or the populated areas until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. Exactly. And the forehead is going to be important because he doesn't seem to know what this is. So we're going to explain what that is really quick. And then in the mark of the beast, it says he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. So there's just one difference between these two signs is one, the the devils can be taken on the hand and the forehead. So let's see. It says the Sabbath is a sign of God. It is the seal of his law, Isaiah 8, 16. It is the token of his authority and power, Exodus 20, 8 through 11. It is a sign whereby we may know that he is God, and therefore it is appropriately said to be placed in the forehead. The worshipers of the beast, Revelation 13, are said to receive the mark in their foreheads or in their hands. The worshipers of the beast are said to receive his mark in their foreheads or in their hands, as the forehead represents intellect, and I'll say like free choice, Mm -hmm. choosing freely. The hand represents power, Psalms 89, 48. Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Compulsory worship is not acceptable to God. His servants are sealed only in their foreheads. So you see, we've been advocating God is a God of free choice this whole time, and you see the seal for God can only apply here because he will never force. And so when when Robert Breaker is trying to determine what this is, Well, we actually have an example. First is the temptation Jesus had in the wilderness with the devil. The very last temptation, he shows him the kingdoms of the world and says, if you bow down and worship me, I'll give you everything. So the number one thing Satan wants is a worship-based thing. Then you have the examples of uh, the three Hebrew boys sitting in front of the the golden image with everybody out there, and it's basically like bow down or die which sounds much like either worship the image or die. And here's literally a golden image. What was that about? Was it about anything other than worship? That's all it was about. It said, bow down and worship me. It's the same thing Nebuchadnezzar said. He said, bow down and worship me. Uh, And so what he's not really seeing is there's a typology there where those three boys, they, they stood up. And the only outward sign of faith that they had to do is not bow the knee. That's all they had to do. It sounds you know easier probably said than done, but there were people in that group that bowed the knee because they believed 
in what Nebuchadnezzar was doing. And there were people who bowed the knee out of not wanting to lose their livelihoods and die. Yeah. And that is what's considered the forehand, uh, the, the hand. So like you have these two elements of either choosing to go along with the system or being compelled to go along with the system because you're too afraid yeah. of the consequences. So hopefully that decodes it for people who watch. It's no big mystery, but it's both of them are about worship. It's yeah. just whether you're going along with it willingly or unwillingly. And God's system only takes the willingly. There is no hand aspect to it. And that's the same reason the Jews... Um, put the little box on their forehead and mm. strapped it to the back of their hand because that was signifying that the the thought, right? Mm. So we have the same symbols taking place here. Yep. And again, I've pointed this out before, but uh, Sabbath is a sign and the seal of God. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath. The commandment says, remember. Yeah. So like all of these things are set as a distinguishing sign for God's people. No command is ever uh, changed that. So that's our very quick review of why the Mark of the Beast is about worship, yeah. how the two compare against each other, and what the, the hand and the forehead actually yeah. mean. And even, just one more little point, is that word uh, Mark is the same word that God uses all through the New and the Old Testament, where it says his seal or his sign. That's the same word Mark. Mm -hmm. So if he thinks that he is going to have the seal of God, then he should say, I'm going to have a mark put on my forehead. Yep. But I don't believe he thinks that he's going to get, you know, a stamp yeah. on his forehead. Some distinguishing, identifying mark. And everyone talks about the mark of the beast. Nobody ever talks about the seal the, of God. The mark of God. The mark yeah. of God. Yeah. And and we could do, as we have, go back and watch our Sabbath this Sunday yeah. and all the other ones where we show what the mark is from God's standpoint, uh, on, on his side. All right, so let's continue here. By the church, verse 3, that passed through Phoenice and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy unto all the brethren. So now not only Jews are saved, now some Gentiles are getting saved. And when they, were, when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders, and they declared all things that God had done with them. But there rose up a sect of the Pharisees, the sect Okay, a sect is a cult. And these were the bad guys. This was the cult of those that are saying, you got to get back under the law. So anybody that teaches you've got to get back under the law, they're a cult. They're not true Christians. They're the bad guys. I want to be the good guys, so I want to be on the right side. Oh, I want to get on the side of the early Christian council that said, no, 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 it's not keeping the law. It's by grace, through faith that you're saved. Galatians chapter 3 verse 10 says about the law, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. We're not to kill people today. We're under grace. We're not under the law. See, even the verse he said just inferred that we're supposed to keep the law of God. Yeah. I mean, he literally just, just read the verse, which was essentially that, you know, uh, if you don't keep in the ways of the holy law, not the laws of Moses, uh, you will be, you'll be cursed because you're transgressing the law. So that's kind of like what we saw in the last episode where he reads half the verse and then says this applies, reads yeah. the second half and totally ignores that it's in applying to God's law. Letter of the law. What's to come? Well, you know what's to come. There's going to be the tribulation period. And then after that, over here, is going to be the millennium. And the so we get the exciting opportunity to break down the 70 weeks to, in the future, show why that tribulation isn't yeah. real, why the rapture uh, that he describes isn't real, this pre-tribulation rapture, how all of it stems back to the error of the 70 weeks in Daniel 9. And we're going to really deep dive on that in the future. Millennium will be a thousand years. The day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is one day. And so this will be the Sabbath rest of Christ on earth. So that's to come. In heaven. And guess who Jesus will be ruling over? Israel, right? So the Sabbath was for the Jews back then, and it's a shadow of what's coming for the Jews over here. So again, he's giving two groups of people, thinks there's not just God's people and you know, not God's people. He's got Israel and then the church, and they're both God's people, but they at different periods of time. Again, a misunderstanding of the 70 weeks. If he realized the probation closed for the Jews at the end of the 70 weeks in 34 AD, all of this stuff becomes moot. None of it matters anymore. Yeah. 
but we are not under the Sabbath today. And these people run around and they judge you. What did you go to church? Well, I, I go to church on Sunday. Oh, you got the mark of the beast. You're going to hell. That's how they talk. I've heard them talk like that. I'm like, <laughs> That's how they talk. I've heard them talk like that. That, I don't think I've ever sounded like that. <laughs> and if he has met people like that, then I want to apologize on Seventh-day Adventist's behalf. But if he hasn't, and he's indulging, and people haven't sounded like that, uh, then he's just being a, a bit of a, a fanatic a little bit. Um, and he says, that's what they said. Uh, I've, this is what they said. I've heard them say this. And I just want to share what the truth is here. This is actually what Adventism. This say. is what Adventism <laughs> actually says. No one has yet received the mark of the beast. The Pretty testing clear. time has not come. There are true Christians in every church. Whoa, <laughs> what? Because if you were to listen to Breaker, that's just that would be that's against what he says that we teach. Yep. Not only has no one received the mark yet, there are true Christians in every church, not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have had light and seen the obligation of the fourth commandment, just like they see the obligation to put no gods before God and, the, and they uh, have no idols. But when the decree shall go forth, so here now we're getting the time. If he wants to say, we're saying everyone has the mark of the beast, at least, and he says he's read our books. Again, I don't know what books he's read because everything he said about us has been wrong. But this gives us a time frame. When does Seventh-day Adventism say it becomes the mark of the peace? But when the decree shall go forth enforcing the counterfeit Sabbath, and the loud cry of the third angel shall warn men against the worship of the beast and the image, the line will be clearly drawn between the false and the true. Then those who still continue in transgression will receive the mark of the beast." So what we've been saying from the beginning is that no one's received the mark of the beast yet, that there will be a time where this comes to be. And at that point, it becomes the mark of the beast after there's been a yep. clear witness to show that this is the truth. And that's when the no by no cell will be enforced. And yes. that's when all these, you know, processes and these steps, fines, imprisonment, you know, all these things are going to be coming on those who will not follow the church state unification system yes and it's only at that time so he's saying well i'm going to church on sunday i'm not coming home with sores i'm not i don't have any marks of the beast that's because it's not that time yet yeah god has told us the false prophet the second beast of revelation 13 needs to first get all the power of the first beast then he makes an image then comes the the deadly wound being healed and all the world wondering after the beast that's the point where Adventists are saying it's the mark of the beast. Where it says today, we're teaching that God's children are in churches all over the world, and it's our job to give this loud cry before this stuff happens so people don't have to wait till the very last minute. Yeah. I'd rather be warned early and get out before it became close to the mark of the beast. Yeah. And that's what we're trying to do. So he's saying, oh, you're going to hell. You got the mark of the beast. I literally don't know anyone that's ever said that from the Seventh-day Adventist yeah. perspective. The spiritual darkness and alienation from God that exists in the church would constitute Babylon. The great body of Christ's true followers are still to be found in their communion. Again, showing we're not saying that the mark of the beast yet. We think they're God's people in all these churches. It's our job to help them see the truth. And once they're called out, they become powerful witnesses and advocates themselves yeah. for the truth being called out of it, like I had been myself. There are many of these who have never seen the special truths for this time. So we get that. We, we understand that not everybody understands this yet. Not a few are dissatisfied with their present condition and are longing for clearer light. And that goes back to the people in his comment section and in our comment section and the viewers who are saying, I have these questions. And unfortunately, when someone is so emphatic, regardless whether they have all the, the right scriptures to back it up, they can come across convincing. Mm -hmm. And there's people, like we mentioned in his comment section saying, hey, I was wondering about the Sabbath because it seems to be everywhere. Yeah. So people need to see that this is not something that was connected to the ceremonial law. And I, I have to admit, I've seen a lot in our comment section, and even people coming to uh, some sermons that I've given that are not from Seventh-day Adventism. And she got this exactly right. It's because they are dissatisfied with the current state of their church. 
They're dissatisfied because they're not. They're going in there getting fluff every Sunday. They don't know the mark of the beast. No one's teaching prophecy. No one's understanding what these components are, the seal of God, uh, and, and understanding what it means to us and our role, our jobs for this being this end-time church. Yeah. They are longing for clearer light. And so I think God m- brings these things to the surface so the clear can be uh, shown against the, the not so clear. The sign or seal of God is his Sabbath, and the seal or mark of the beast is in direct opposition to it. It is a counterfeit Sabbath on the day of the sun. According to Revelation 14, 9 through 12, they who do not receive the mark of the beast keep the commandments of God, and the Sabbath is in the fourth precept. So I find this fascinating because if you look at Revelation 12, 17, it says, here are they who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. Uh, and so it defines the end time people specifically by them keeping these commandments. Like it's it's their identifying mark. And in that, how do you identify, okay, well, he's not killing people. And how do I know if there's no gods before God? And how do I know he's yep. not worshiping idols? You know what you can't tell? If someone's keeping the Sabbath or not. Mm-hmm. And then that that can fall, again, not for their own righteousness, but as a reflection of faith in the Savior. Does the Bible anywhere in the New Testament tell us to go to church on Saturday? Or do we find in the New Testament people going to church on Sunday? When we go to the New Testament, you know what we find? We find way back here, with the time of Jesus even, people meeting on the first day of the week. You see, Sunday is the first day of the week. That's the first day. Any calendar, you look at it, Sunday's the first day of the week. Saturday, the Sabbath, is the last day of the week. In the Old Testament, they went out and did their thing, and then they took the last day to rest and think about God. In the New Testament, we put God first, always, and we give Him the first day of our week. See how it's different? See how it's changed? And I... No, actually, I don't see how it's changed. You've offered no scripture to support your change. You're saying you put God first because we always put God first. Well, forget what you say. What did God say? He's saying, oh, they kept the seventh day so they could... No, they did it because that's what God said. Yeah. So he's like trying to make this connection. You see how it works? So the Old Testament, they didn't put God first then. That's what he's saying. They put and him that last. By God defining that he did the last day, that God's saying put God last. Yeah. Because they weren't just keeping it arbitrarily on the seventh day like they do the first day. It's just arbitrary. And so like he says, you see how it's different? I can honestly sit here and say, if I were didn't know any of this stuff and we're just watching this, I would say, no, you haven't presented anything to show me what's changed or how it's different. You've just said yeah. that it is. With a nice thing that says we put him at the first because it's the first day of the yeah, week. Yeah, which is all well and good. But you know what's interesting? When I did a breakdown in a sermon about where, and we did this in the, in the Sabbath Sunday, the first one, we saw that that's what the pagan said. That's why this, the day of the sun was always the first day in the pagan worship system because they put that their most supreme God first. And here God's, again, doing the last day because he's trying to contrast from the first day. So that's great, Mr. Breaker. You think that that's what you're doing, but you're not doing so under the guidance of God, nor have you provided any evidence whatsoever from the scriptures or anywhere else that what you're saying is valid. You're just saying, see the connection? And I emphatically say, no, I do not. It's, it's, you know, you don't honor God by doing what you want. That's the Cain mentality. This is how, exactly, it's, it's exactly what Cain did. You know what? I'm actually better than Abel yep. because I'm going to do this. I'm going to give God all my hard effort. That's exactly what he's saying. I put God first because I'm going to do it my way, yep. not the way that he instituted it. Yep. But I think that the first day sounds better because I can say I'm putting him first. And that's a straw man argument. Yeah. Cain did the same thing. Oh, God wasn't happy that I did worship this way? Yeah. No, because that's exactly against what he said to do. He yeah. said to bring a lamb. He said the last day. So just because you think it sounds nicer doesn't mean you can change the day. No, it doesn't. And it also it kind of defeats the idea that you're giving up everything to God because what God says goes. And here he's saying, no, I can do one better. God, I'm going to put you first. Look at what I'm doing for uh-huh. you. <laughs> Again, that's he's actually wearing the works uh, cloak now. Very interesting. I want you to see. 
Don't ever belong to a denomination that teaches something without finding out first if the Bible preaches that. I agree. Jesus was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. What day was that third day? He rose on Sunday. So and rested on the, the week, Sabbath. Yeah, well, let's look at Jesus that. Because he just made the best point in favor of the Sabbath, and he doesn't even realize it. So let's just look at this really quickly. He just said that, uh, and what day did Jesus rise on the third day? He said that rose on a Sunday. If he rose on a Sunday, what did he do on the seventh day? He rested. He rested. He rested on the seventh day. The proof that he rose on the first day is proof that he rested on the seventh. Yeah. And even when they took him off the cross, they didn't finish the burial process so they wouldn't break the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. If it was so abundantly clear in everything that Jesus said and everything that he did that the Sabbath was null and void, why did they still not even wrap their Lord on the Sabbath. Yeah. You'd think if there's ever justification to do something like to that. To do something, then it would have been that. Yeah. Yeah. It says, At last Jesus was at rest. The long day of shame and torture was ended. As the last rays of the setting sun ushered in the Sabbath, the Son of God laid in quietude in Joseph's tomb. His work completed, his hands folded in peace, he rested through the sacred hours of the Sabbath day. In the beginning, the Father and Son had rested upon the Sabbath after their works of creation, which we saw in the scriptures. He was there and the worlds were made through him. So we know this is a, this is a true statement. When the heavens and earth were finished and all the hosts of them, Genesis 2.1, the Creator and all heavenly beings rejoiced in contemplation of the glorious scene. The morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now Jesus rested from the work of redemption, and though there was grief among those who loved him on earth, yet there was a great joy in heaven. Glorious to the eyes of heavenly beings was the promise of the future, a restored creation, a redeemed race that, having conquered sin, should never fall. This, the result to flow from Christ's completed work, God and angels saw. Let's look at this even more. Christ rested in the tomb on the Sabbath day, and when holy beings of both heaven and earth were astir on the morning of the first day of the week, he rose from the grave to renew his work of teaching his disciples. But this fact does not consecrate the first day of the week and make it the Sabbath. The Sabbath institution originated in Eden. The very first words of the fourth commandment are, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The law of the Ten Commandments of which the Sabbath forms a part, Christ declares, as we've seen till heaven and earth, not one jot or tittle will pass from the law. So long as the heavens and earth endure, the Sabbath will continue to endure as a sign of the Creator's power. Where does God say to use the first day to put God first? Because like he can say that, where does God say it? And, and it's nowhere to be found. So the idea that Jesus rising on the first day somehow negated the commandments is, uh, to me, like a false pretext because you've just made the assumption and provided no evidence other than them meeting up. How does that match keeping holy something designed by God? It just doesn't make any sense to me. And we're going to see that in the scripture. So Jesus appeared to the disciples. Read that again. On Sunday, did they take the mark of the beast? So he obviously so doesn't realize Sunday, that the mark of the beast is still be not. Okay, so the apostles were wrong. Is that what you're telling me? No, we're saying that the apostles met on the first day. Just like people meet up for Bible study and listen to people talk, you can go see a lecture on the first day. Yeah. Nobody said to change it to the holy day of God. It seems that simple to me. Clearly, we see from the foundation, after Jesus rose from the dead, they meet on Sunday. There's a pattern of them continually meeting together on Sunday. Matter of fact, sometimes they'll meet together on a Saturday and a Sunday. You know, the Bible says you can meet on any day. He that regardeth the day unto the Lord, let him regard it, the Bible says. Okay. No problem. Then leave Sabbath keepers alone. Yeah. <laughs> What's the problem? Yeah, because he's then saying that, oh, well, we're trying to get people to stop worshiping on Sunday. But there is no problem with worshiping God every single day. There's only one day that God said he said it. Up. That, that's the point. He's making it seem like we get to choose. Worship, yeah, worship God on any day, but there's only one day God set aside, which I think we've made abundantly clear now. And also, it would be wrong 
to set aside a day as a holy day. So there's a difference between, and now we promote having Bible study every day. Yeah. Right? And, but not uh, sanctifying Sunday. So we can't take all the applications of the Sabbath, which is, you know, don't do your own will and all the things that are in the fourth commandment. It even says not to let those who are within your gates, whether that be your wife, nor your ox, nor the stranger in your gate should work and do commerce and all these things on Sabbath. Now put that onto Sunday. So if you want to have a Bible study in your house every single day, that's fine. But if you're going to now honor Sunday as if it was the Sabbath, then there's a problem there. Mm -hmm. There exactly. is. Yeah. Because you're then putting a sanctity of your own volition, whether whoever met on that day and had lunch together, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It wasn't, didn't have that stamp of God with his finger yeah. in stone. There is no direct command by God to either remove it, change it, or anything. There's never been, as we've talked about now at length, anything like that. It's never ever wrong to meet together with other Christians on any day. I agree. And remember Jesus. And it's not the mark of the beast to come together on a certain day. But let's look at what the scripture says here. Not until the decree goes forth that commands all to hallow a day that God has not hallowed, and it's going to be done by the government, civil government, in a unified church state setup of some kind. Yeah. That's have, when it becomes the mark of the beast. You'll have to honor Sunday and dishonor Sabbath. You will have to choose between your livelihood or God. Who can actually sustain your livelihood, but people will trick themselves into thinking that they he he won't or can't yeah. or something like that. So, like when he's saying, "How did the apostles?" It's because none of this stuff happens until the end of time, until a decree goes forth. There's a very clear starting point, and there was too when the the Jesus said, "When the the city is surrounded, then you know yep. to flee." And so we're kind of saying the, the same thing. When you see the church state coming together and they issue this, this decree, we don't want you to wait that long. But that's the time when you gotta got to flee. It has now become the mark of the beast. Yeah. There's no reason to wait to the end for that to occur. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. So Paul is holding a church service on Sunday. <gasps> the mark of the beast! Oh no, Paul! Why would you do that? That's the mark of the beast, people say. People are wrong, aren't they? And people say, oh, this whole meeting on Sunday that started with this guy. Uh, he says Paul held uh, a like church, church service. service on Sunday. It just says he preached to them. He like taught them. Have you ever been to a crusade or a, a series where they talk Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? Exactly. Several days in a row. Yeah. And, and you can, that doesn't mean I'm making it church. That doesn't mean I'm, I'm taking the solemnity of something since creation and moving yeah. it to another day. I made it a law, and it's wrong because they never met on Sunday before this. This is the... And you look at your Bible and go, no, 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 Jesus showed up on Sunday, and they're meeting together on Sunday, and here's Paul, and here's Paul probably around 60 AD, so maybe 30 years after, and he's meeting on Sunday. And you're out there saying, no, you got to keep the law and you can't worship on Sunday. You have to worship on Saturday. You're part of that. You're one of those. You need to get over here and you need to get in the Bible. And so, again, um, I'm sure that some of these guys have a prayer meeting or a, or a study on a Wednesday or a Thursday. Are they now saying that that's the day that is replacing the Sabbath? Mm -hmm. No. So even they are contradicting their line of reasoning that just meeting and having a Bible study means that that's now the new Sabbath. Yeah, he met up and gave one sermon that wasn't about changing the day, and somehow the entirety has changed. Like, it just lacks so much evidence. It's, it's, it's crazy. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and verse 2, Paul says, notice what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, it's the mark of the beast to go to church on Sunday. He never says that. Someone has made that up. And who was that someone? Ellen G. White, Miller, all these people that started this cult religion of mixing the law and grace, and they don't mix. And as we've seen, every statement he's given that's said a solid statement about Adventism, we've proven through our own texts that it's just not the case. He, he clearly doesn't know. So it's, it's not a, 
a fair uh, assessment of the situation. And so I think anybody who can see that can now take his statements about Ellen White and William Miller and all these guys and have some doubt that what he's saying is true because yeah. we've seen so clearly that uh, in the face of the evidence that he's, he's not telling the truth. And trying to get you back under the Sabbath, and it doesn't work. Then when Paul came and visited them on Sunday, they would say, Hey, Paul, we've been taking up an offering every first day of the week that we met. And here's the offering for the church in Jerusalem. And I'll just say that's another proof that Sunday couldn't be a replacement for Sabbath. Because when you give offerings on uh, Sabbath, 10% of your earnings or more uh, go to God. You don't collect it up for other people. Yeah. It's going towards the, the, the church, the service. The, uh, it, in his case, it's like a group of us get together and we ask the community to fund us to go do witnessing door-to-door and th- stuff like that. That's not giving my tithe to God. Right. Abraham gave 10% to Melchizedek, knowing through faith, again, the mm-hmm. faith covenant, that he realized that this is a sign that you give to God on his holy day, Everything you have is his. So t- giving ten percent back is just giving him what he already is already yeah. his. And to me, the fact that Paul is taking up collections for the saints and not ten percent tithe for God clearly proves that we're dealing with something different than Sabbath. Because Paul was a Jew, he was a Pharisee before he was converted. He was like you, you read his writings. He was a highly intelligent Pharisaical law yeah. master, essentially. And so when he comes and and does these things, he knows the importance of the Sabbath probably better than almost anybody. And so I don't think there's any justification or proof that we I've been shown or that he's shown that Paul intended to shift everything of his own volition to this new day. Yeah. Now, why did they meet on Sunday? Because that was the day that Jesus rose from the dead. I get so many emails from this. Did they say so that? So many people. Did they ever say, we're meeting today because Jesus rose today. Yeah. Where's the evidence? He's making huge jumps in logic saying, "Where's prove it from the Bible, prove it from the Bible. Do they even read their Bibles? These are a lot of statements, <laughs> but that are never, ever said. There's, there's no statement where Paul says, I'm going to preach to you today on Sunday because Jesus rose from the dead. Yep. Let's get together on Sunday to worship it as holy because Jesus rose from the dead. Where's the evidence? Where's the scripture that proves this? And he just, there's never an answer because there isn't one. You cannot produce it because it does not exist. Are in a cult that tell them, no, we're still under the Old Testament law. We still got to go to church on, on Saturday. So Sunday worship is what the Bible teaches that the early church followed. Now, I want to look at first day worship uh, examples here because there's only a few of them. There's really not much. Resurrection Sunday. The most significant event associated with this Sunday is the resurrection of Jesus, the breaking of bread that happens in Act 20. They gathered on the first day of the week and broke bread. Like you said, they had lunch, they had a meal, they talked about God, nothing there that would change the solemnity. Uh, And then it says collecting offerings on the first day. Now, uh, in all of these other situations, we see that um, it's God that has spoken these things. So I'm actually going to skip forward to, to come back. So when we look at the commandments, how we got those, let's read Exodus 20 verses 1 and through kind of 11, or 1 and 11. And God spake all these words. Skip, skip down. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So who said it? God, because he spoke it. Yeah. And here's Exodus 31, 12, 16, and 17. And the Lord spake unto Moses and saying, for a perpetual covenant, it's a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Yeah. Uh, again, the Lord had to speak it. Where's the evidence that the Lord spoke anything? And so I went back to the record and said, okay, where in any of the first day references is there even a representative of God? And I'm not saying like a person here on earth. Where's the angel? Where's God himself speaking? And there's only one instance, and it's the angel that's at the tomb. So let's read that really quick. Matthew 28, 1, 5 5 through 7. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Okay. Even in the first day of the week uh, promotion, it's he's saying at the end of the Sabbath, and then it's the first day. So it's acknowledging that the Sabbath is is still in place, and it's still something, and that whatever had to occur had to occur after the Sabbath. Okay, now here's the angel. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. 
He is not here, for he's risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And now here's this instruction. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead and changed the solemnity of the Sabbath to Sunday. And now we want everyone to keep Sunday as a celebration of the resurrection, not the creation. Is that what it says? Never. Never. What a great opportunity he had here to change all this. The representative of God coming down. And he says, go tell the disciples. Yeah. But what he doesn't say is he doesn't give any instruction whatsoever to change anything about the law of God. Nor could he, because it's an expression of his character. So even if we just take, as we saw in the Old Testament, the means by which we got the old one, how can we get the means for the new one? And it, it doesn't exist. Even yeah. the representative of God there, there's no aspect of which that the law has changed in any way. Okay, and here's the last uh, last few things. Uh, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached to them. And if you keep and 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 so I started thinking to myself, okay, it's the first day of the week. He's preaching. What's he preaching? He's probably preaching. He was just you know uh, around the disciples who were with Jesus. He's probably preaching about Jesus. And what did Jesus say? He's probably said something like, "If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love." That's probably what he's saying on the first day of the week. Something along these lines. And he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Yep. So again, we're just seeing that let's look at the total references to both Sabbath and seventh day in the Old and New Testament. Okay, so any first day worship references in the Old Testament? None. Zero. Nope. Doesn't exist. And people would say, of course, because that's where it is. But even in the New Testament, the Sabbath is referenced 64 times. The first day is referenced and not even in relation to worship, just any reference to the first day is 30 times. So more than double it's uh, spoken in the New Testament. Almost yep. half, uh, one-third of the book of Revelation is quoting the Old Testament. So much of what Jesus said, even in, including at the temptation, were Old Testament quotes. Yep. So we're just seeing here like uh, an overwhelming side for the Sabbath and very little, again, in and for the first day. And then one's embedded in the commandments— as the, the seventh day is the fourth commandment, which commandment is the first day? It doesn't even have that. No commandment. It's not a commandment. It's not anywhere. So like the body of evidence really keeps stacking up uh, for the seventh day. Now he keeps saying coming together, meeting up, meeting up, coming together. Compare that to keep it holy. There's a totally different dynamic yeah. there. It says, and upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came to break bread, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay him in stores. God hath prospered. And God spake all these words, for in six days the Lord made heaven and the earth, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So here are all the references to the first day, and I just choose one reference, and it says, God blessed it and hallowed it. Yeah. Where's the evidence for the first day? It's not in the New Testament. We've already seen it's the Catholic Church that has done these, done these things. Beast. Well, Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 through 18 says, And he gave power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Here is the passage in the Bible about the mark of the beast. It's in the forehead or in the right hand. And he said, it says in that verse, it says, here is wisdom. And so it's basically saying, you are meant to understand this. You are. This yeah. is not a hidden, never to be understood thing. And we're going to see he doesn't understand it. It's connected with an image and you being killed for not worshiping that image. That's so he sees, he admits there, it's it's about worship. It's about worship. So when we're talking about a day, what do you do on that day? What does he worship. do on Sunday? He worships. What do we do on Sabbath? We worship. What is the mark of the beast about? You worship. It, worship. What was the image in Nebuchadnezzar and the, and the three Hebrew boys? Worship. It was worship. So the, every single piece, and he's like, how is it about a, a, a day? And it mattered with the three Hebrews, that they worshipped that day. Yeah. Because all the other time before, it didn't matter. It was when the music sounds, that day, that moment, worship. Yes. It's always Bow about down the and day. worship. Yes. The day and the worship. And so he's like, how does it? how is it about a day? How is it not about a day when you really look at the whole, whole picture? The Antichrist. And the number is 666. 
Where is the number six on going to church on Sunday? I know Saturday is the seventh day of the week, but does that mean anything? So now he's just like uh, just randomly he, looking he at numbers. What is this six? What could that mean? So he can't tell you who the first beast of Revelation thirteen is. He can't tell you who the second beast of Revelation thirteen is. He can't tell you what the image is. He can't tell you what the mark is. He can't tell you what six 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 is. Nobody should be getting their end time eschatology from somebody who can't answer those questions and prove it from the Bible and the Bible alone. You don't need Adventist writings. You can prove it just using the scriptures. Yeah. Uh, and what I found interesting is you asked me, well, what denomination is is Robert Breaker? And I said I wasn't sure, so I did a little digging and found out that he was he is a Baptist. And I went back and I said, well, wait a second. Didn't the Baptists around the Reformation era, weren't a few of them that knew? Because all the Reformers identified yep. the papacy as the Antichrist and the Pope as the yep. man of sin. So here he is all these years later as a Baptist, and he doesn't even know that his own denomination has previously taught that the Pope and the papacy is the Antichrist and the man of sin. And we're going to look at, at that example really quick here. So the first one is Roger Williams. He's the first Baptist pastor in America. He comes in and he gives a sermon where he says, The pretended vicar of Christ on earth who sits as God over the temple of God, exalting himself not only above all that is called God and skip down, but he is the son of perdition. So the, the, the Baptists knew early on that the, the Pope was the Antichrist, and the 666 is in relation to Ficarius Philae Dei, which is on the triple tiara crown. It's harder to find now, but they used yep. to wear it quite, quite a bit. And for anyone who's guessing what 666 is, that 666 is, it's pointing back to the Pope, and it's pointing it's to— It's a system. It's a system. It's pointing to the system of the papacy. We're not talking about Pope Francis. He's just the guy sitting there now. But it's the seat of the Pope, and the, the Catholic system is the head of the religious organization for Satan here on earth. And they knew that. But people will say, well, that's just one guy at the very beginning. Look at this. The Baptist Confession of Faith. This is their Confession of Faith. Mm -hmm. Point number four. The Lord Jesus is the head of the church, in whom, and we're going to skip to, is invested in the supreme and sovereign manner. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be head thereof, but is that of Antichrist. Yeah. So are Adventists saying this, or do Baptists say this? It's in their confession of faith. Yep. Yeah. I mean, and Robert Breaker is giving us a hard time when his own uh, roots for his denominational belief system also understood that the papacy... Yeah. And this, the Pope, are these figures. So, Lutherans, Baptists, all of these people. Presbyterians, Methodists. They all agreed. All of them. Yeah. A hundred, it, there's there never There was been, unanimity yeah, consensus, on this doctrine. Which is, it, it drove Rome so mad that they came up with futurism to try to confuse people. Yeah. And that's where you end up with a seven-year tribulation at the end of time, which is what Breaker's teaching. He's fumbling around trying to figure out what 666 is. Here it is. There's your Antichrist. He has been around since the time of Paul, and then that spirit of Antichrist manifested in the fullness of the of the Pope. Yeah. Right here's the first day of the week. How how is this the mark of the beast going to church on Sunday? And so now it starts to make sense when his own denomination has identified the papacy, and the papacy says it's our mark that we've changed the Sabbath to Sunday, and now the whole world and the Protestant world's keeping it. I just answered your question, Mr. Breaker. Yeah. <laughs> That's how it becomes about worship, because the one who sits as 666 said he's changed the solemnity by their authority. Now you can see how it's arrived as the mark of the beast in direct contrast to the seventh day worship. Yeah. And how can they say that that's wrong and it's evil if we see Jesus appearing and they're assembled on Sunday? We see the other apostles, we see Paul meeting on Sunday. How, how could they have a leg to stand on? The entire system crumbles. And what's funny to me is, like, if anything's crumbled, it seems like it's his theology that, you know, and of course we're sitting as the ones advocating against what he's, he's saying, but just, I would like to hear maybe from the commenters down below, maybe from those who aren't Adventists and, and aren't necessarily on either of our sides, when you watch this and you hear the, tell us if this, if this is a compelling argument against what he's saying, because he's saying his is so good that it's all just crumbled down. And to me, we've spent the last like six hours <laughs> breaking down why this is, is not the case. And I hope our, our viewers will share with us. Don't be afraid to tell us if you think mm -hmm. Breaker's more compelling and has better evidence. I would love to hear that too. But if you think we, we have shown a more compelling argument, please share with that in, in the comments.
And for those who are wondering, who are you talking about, Brother Breaker? Well, there's a lot of different denominations out there, but probably the biggest one is the SDAs. So the Seventh-day Adventist claims to be a church, and they claim to say, going to church on Sunday is the biblical mark of the beast. And yet you can still buy and sell on Sunday, and you're not killed, and there's, there's no guy, there's no Antichrist here yet. There's the spirit of Antichrist, but not the man. And as we see, that's just not true. It's it's the seat of the Pope. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 16, verse 2, about the mark of the beast. Revelation 16, 2 tells us more about the mark of the beast. I just want to make one more addition here. He says that the Antichrist is a single individual. And that's not what Paul said. And he's the one advocating Paul. And he says that the spirit of Antichrist is already at work. Mm -hmm. So is this person like 2,000 years old? That yeah, he said the spirit's there, but the man's not. So yeah, He just like, hasn't showed up yet, but he's actually still already working in the yeah. background. He's not 2,000 years old. No. So there's something else, you know, going yeah. on here. And what does spirit of Antichrist mean? You can't just be like, oh, it's floating around. No, it's yeah. specifically referring to the pagan Roman Empire. And the event which would bird the little horn, the 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 man of sin, the papal power, and you know he's just kind of reaching, grasping at straws because he doesn't know where to look yeah. or how to identify. But it. this was very clear, like we said, Lutherans, Baptists, all these people. This was very clear. Yeah, and and it's a, it was a universally held doctrine. I don't know why it changed so much between now and then that only Advent Adventists are claiming this anymore. But it wasn't our doctrine to begin with. Adventists didn't even exist at the time that they made this. This uh, consensus. First went and poured out his vial upon the earth, and there fell a noisome and grievous sore upon the men which had the mark of the beast, and upon them which worshipped his image. The Bible says if you take the mark of the beast, you're going to have a sore. Question, if you go to church on Sunday, do you ever come home and you go, oh man, I got a sore? No, you don't. Because it's not talking about the mark of the beast as going to church on Sunday. It's talking about in the future, in the tribulation period, out here, someone taking a specific mark in their right hand or their forehead. Well, we agree that it's something that happens in the future. And he apparently, in all his studious reading of our books, missed that we also are saying this mm -hmm. is in the future. And we showed it's by this decree that's going to go forth. And those people who take that mark will have a sore. So someone is not rightly dividing. Someone is not reading their Bible. Someone is twisting the scriptures. And, and we do believe that those who receive the mark of the beast will receive the sores. Yeah. Because it says in Revelation 14 that they'll be receiving brimstone and all these things. Don't receive the mark of the beast. And the people who have the mark of the beast will also be receiving Revelation 16 which is the sores and then all the rest of the plagues, which yeah. is what Revelation 16 is. And so we know that the, the sores are part of the plagues. So does he think that the Adventists think that the plagues are being poured out or should right be being poured out right now or in the past or since of 190 AD? Yeah. Like it just doesn't make any sense. Ours is also triggered by things at the end of, the, at end of time, which will make it all very clear. And they're trying to make it a salvation issue. And they're trying to say, you got to keep the Sabbath or you can't be saved. He's, now, they'll tell you. But he's made it salvational that you do not keep the Sabbath because if you are keeping the law, yeah. you're an adulterer, you're a sinner. Mm -hmm. An idol idol worshiper. Idol calls. worshiper, yeah. works-based. Mm -hmm. and He said we're going to be damned because we do this. Yeah, exactly. So he's making the same argument. He is. That's a good point. In the Seventh-day Adventist, oh, we don't believe that, we don't believe that. No, that's what you believe. Let's... And now he's telling us what we believe. He's like, no, that's what you believe. Yeah. Well, I hope 14, we made it pretty clear what we believe now, believe based on the information we have. If you claim to believe that taking the mark of the beast is going to church on Sunday, then you are saying that everyone that goes to church on Sunday is going to hell. That's a whole other thing, the doctrine of hell. Hell is not a place that burns forever. It is an event that will extinguish all sin from existence forever. So maybe we can plant that seed, but we're not going there today. Yeah. <laughs> but we do not teach that everyone is going to hell. Uh, but people who are uh, have the mark of the beast will experience exactly what it says in the Bible, the full wrath of God and the second death, which will end in the lake of fire and the extinguishing from all existence.
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand. See, it's not going someplace on some day. It's actually taking it here or here. Now, this cult says, Well, if you go to church on Sunday, that's the mark of the beast. What are they saying? According to what the Bible says. If that is the mark of the beast, then anyone that goes to church on Sunday is going to hell. That's what they believe. That's what they teach. Now, they might it's not what we believe. It's not what we teach. We hope that's been abundantly clear by now that he's making gross overgeneralizations. And he's like, it is what they believe. They say it's not, but it is. Well, no. Where's your proof? He hasn't shown uh, outright it. state that, but that's where their doctrine leads them if they are consistent. I submitted to you they are not consistent. And they made that up way back in the 1800s. And they said, you shouldn't go to church on Sunday. That's the mark of the beast. And they have set themselves on a foundation of this great lie in which they say, starting church on Sunday started way back in about 190 AD with these guys, and then it became a law with this guy. And so these guys started the Sunday worship, but before that, no, 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 nobody worshiped on Sunday. And I have gone to the scriptures itself, but I've showed you Jesus appeared on Sunday. And the and yet he's provided not a single evidence for the Sabbath being moved to Sunday. But even, like he said, Jesus appeared on Sunday. I don't remember anything where Jesus said, okay, we're going to have Sunday school, I'm going to give you a sermon, where now you honor this day, don't work this give me day. Give your tithes for that day. Like He woke up on Sunday. He folded his clothes. He did regular work. He left his house. He went all the way back to heaven. That does not sound like he Sabbathed Sunday No. all of a sudden. No. He, the only place he rested in that whole week between his torture and his he resurrection. He rolled a gigantic stone out of the way of the grave. Yeah. He did so much work on that day, all the way to heaven, all the way back. Yeah. Wow. Early church was meeting together. And the apostles and Paul meeting on Sunday. So obviously, if you're a true Bible believer and you love truth, you admit the truth. Sunday worship has always been since the time of Jesus. And yet he still never provided a single verse to support that there's been any change or it's supposed to replace the Sabbath. It doesn't matter what these guys said or did. There's always been worshiping on Sunday from the beginning of the early church. And there's nothing wrong with going to church on Sunday. Now, let's look at the Apostle Paul because I want to um, show you this. Paul would go to church on Saturday and Sunday. And most of his ministry, the, everywhere he went, he would go on a Saturday and march right into a Jewish synagogue and start telling them about Jesus. So clearly Paul is, is going somewhere on Saturday. But that's the synagogue of the Jews. And where he is on Saturday, he always makes time on Sunday to start a church. So Jews on Saturday, the church on Sunday. And you see this pattern repeated over and over again. Let me give you some examples. Acts chapter 13 and verse 14. But when they had departed from Perga, they came to Antioch and Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Okay, so he goes into the synagogue. Is the synagogue the church? No, the synagogue is where the Jews meet, and they meet on Saturday. And after the reading of the law and of the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And so Paul stands up and begins to speak. All right, now look at verse 42. I'm just going to give you some examples. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought them, that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. Here's some Gentiles that were going to the Jewish synagogue. And they said, Paul, we like what you say. Would you come over here with us and, and, and meet with us next Saturday? So even next the, Saturday. Exactly. <laughs> he, they, 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 even the Gentiles weren't like, oh, can you make a new day? And Paul wasn't like, no, don't, don't go there Our on the Saturday. Our day is Sunday. Yeah. He, they're literally going to meet him there on the Sabbath. And then he's going to yeah. give an example of when he meets him on the first day. But imagine being new to all this. You go and you're just like enthralled on the Sabbath, but you want to learn more and you want to ask questions. And, and the church and the synagogue is not the place to do that. Well, can we meet up on, on Monday? Can we meet up on Sunday? And I can ask you a question. Maybe you could yeah. teach us some more. 
That's what's happening with this whole first day setup. And that's the only thing that is expressed in the intent of what's being said, because as we've seen, there's been no expressed change anywhere. Yeah. Paul said, okay. Because everything that Paul did, he did with a reason. He went to the Jew first and then to the Gentiles. And as you look, and we're about to see this, I'm going to show you the scriptures. When he'd get the Gentiles saved, he would start to preach on Sunday with them and started a Sunday worship in his church. In his church. Did Paul start a Sunday worship in Paul's church? Whose church is this, Paul's or, or Jesus? Sounds like St. Paul. Sounds like he's ca- saying ca- Catholic it's, doctrine it, almost. It does sound like Catholic doctrine. <laughs> that he started. The church that he started. So he's saying that Paul started the Sunday church. Yeah. But I think there's no proof of any of that either. But he always went on Saturday because that was the day the Jews were accustomed to going. He was trying to reach the Jews. Now, look at, for example, chapter 14 and verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews. And so spake that the great multitude, both of the Jews and also the Greeks, believed. These so who, now his Gentiles asked him to speak the next Sabbath. Then he goes another Sabbath, the Jews. Yep. And who else is there? The, the Greeks. The Greeks are there too. What are all these people doing there on the Sabbath day? Gentiles, Jewish proselytes that would go on Saturday. 17 and verse 1. Acts chapter 17 and verse 1. And when they had passed through Amphip- Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where it was a synagogue of the Jews. Uh, look at verse 10. So, one second. He said there's this pattern yeah. where he goes on Saturday and then Sunday. But so far, it was Saturday, then Saturday, 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 Saturday. The whole way through here. With all with Jews, Jews and Gentiles. And Greeks yeah. and Gentiles, yeah. which is the same thing. And never mentioned the first day once. No, not yet. And then when they finally do, it just reads as though, hey, they wanted to talk to him after the Sabbath in a more appropriate setting to do so. Yeah. And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night into Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Uh, Acts 18.4. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. So where's your Sunday argument in here, Robert? Yeah. I haven't heard a single thing that supports the solemnity of anything being changed. And because he's not saying it's Sunday is Sabbath, all we need to see is just a, a avoiding of the law. There actually doesn't need to be a new commandment to keep Sunday holy. So I'll at least give him that. But where's the one that devoids the the Sabbath teaching? Because everything that he said about the law over the last four or five hours that we've been talking about this has been in relation to the law of Moses and not the law of God. So I'm still waiting. So he's going wherever he goes to the Jew first. He said that in Romans 1.16. I made a statement. And my statement was, Paul went on Saturday to Jews. He'd get some of them saved and some Gentiles saved, and then he'd start a church on Sunday. Now, people are probably going to argue with that. Say, I don't believe that, I don't believe that. Okay, let me show you that in the Bible. Acts chapter 18 and verse 6. Acts 18, 6 through 8. And when they had opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go into the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now people would say, well, that's when when he started the church in Corinth, but they only met on Saturday. 1 Corinthians 16. He... But again, it's not about, like, they only met. Like, it's it's about, again, the solemnity of the, of the Sabbath day. Yeah. Writing to Corinth upon the first day of the week. It even said he he and he and he joined the synagogue. He was uh, the the convert that he had was so excited that he joined the synagogue, and even the ruler of the synagogue believed. But the person that believed Paul, the first thing he did was join the synagogue, and then went and listened to other days when when Paul was speaking. That every one of you lay by him in store, as God had prospered him, prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. Why would he tell them to take up offerings on a Sunday? Well, we've already explained that. So we're going to finish up here with, did Paul really start his own church? Because that is the contention of Breaker here. And I just don't think that, that there's any proof that he kick-started getting rid of the seventh day to go for this first day church. 
It says, Before his conversion, Paul had regarded himself as blameless, touching the righteousness which is in the law. Philippians 3, 6. But since his change of heart, he gained a clear conception of the mission of the Savior as the Redeemer of the entire race, Gentile as well as Jew, and had learned the difference between a living faith and a dead formalism. That's what legalism is. Legalism, to keeping all these laws, even if it's the Ten Commandments and the Sabbath, for your own salvation, legalism, throw it out the window. It's, it's bad doctrine. But what does it say? God's unchangeable law of Ten Commandments, however, Paul still kept in spirit as well as letter. What did Paul do? He went on into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. It says, as his manner was, he went to them three Sabbath days and reasoned with them. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath. Mm-hmm. He said, Gentiles besought these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. And the next Sabbath he came, almost the whole city together, to hear the word of God. The pattern, whether you hear it from the Catholic Church, whether you hear it from the Bible, whether you look at historians, Josephus, whether you look at any of these groups, yeah. nobody's keeping Sunday holy. Yeah or nobody's gotten rid of the seventh-day Sabbath. And Paul, as a Pharisee, shows time and time again that even if he met up to study with people, he always kept the Sabbath and taught people to do the same. So, Brother McKenzie, I think we've come to the end of the road. This has been uh, a lot of information probably for some Hmm. who haven't heard this before. So please go back, rewind. (laughs) <laughs> we don't rewind anymore. Jump down. <laughs> Hit the, the skip timeline. button 10 seconds yeah. back. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever you need to do to absorb this information. Yeah. Open your Bible up. Read the verses. Read them in context. Read before and read after so that you get the, the holistic understanding of what's taking place. Yep. Yeah. And again, we hope that uh, this is something that is meant to edify, educate, and to bring us all to study the Word together in hopes that we don't get deceived by bad doctrine, by uh, not paying attention and not taking this stuff seriously. If we've shown anything, it's that whether you believe Sabbath or Sunday, the worship element of all this is so important, and it's going to come down into the mark of the beast at some point. And if people can't tell you what that is and walk you through the Scriptures and show you why, then maybe you need to find another place to look. Yeah. We appreciate you, brothers and sisters, sharing, supporting, donating, commenting. Like This is really the way that we can spread this message together. We're on the same team, and I really hope that we all get to embrace together to worship our Savior for all of eternity. And make sure you go to the description, because we have all of our links to different locations there, whether that's the newsletters, to adtv.watch, our donation page, all of those things is in the description, so take a look. And then... When you go to adtv.watch, you'll have the resources for these videos. Mm -hmm. So you'll be able to look at them again, not just in the video, but actually download them for yourself. Mm -hmm. Yep, I should have these presentations up on the website, hopefully uh, around the same time of the launch. And we're constantly adding more resources to our videos. We kind of have posted many over the years. Now we're going back and adding. Uh, But the idea is to give you everything we have and give it to you for free. So if that's valuable to you and what we do here, please, whether it's a dollar, ten dollars, a hundred, or a million, uh, please support what we're doing if you think this work is is helping people. So please make sure that you like and you share these videos with others that you think would be benefited by, by it, and we will close with prayer. Matt, would you like to close for us? Sure. Great merciful God of heaven, Lord, we just thank you once again for the uh, the ability and the privilege of sharing this information, that we can go to your word to let the word be the the thing that settles all matters, that it not be our thoughts, our opinions, our feelings, things that are tradition that our family has brought up in, brought us up in, but you say to deny all, to deny mother, father, brother, sister, wife, child, if necessary, to follow you. And so, Lord, that's what we ask for, that right spirit to follow you in all things. We ask for blessings for uh, Robert Breaker and those that follow his ministry to see this and to be moved uh, in the truth, because I believe that you love them and care for them and that you uh, could make them very powerful witnesses for the truth if we just could come together and reason together. So we pray that this has been a blessing for everyone as it's been a blessing for us. Thank you for this, Lord. In the name of our Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen.